All right. Can everybody hear me? Can I get a thumbs up from some people who are on video? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I got kicked out there for a second, so I just want to make sure I was fully back in. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our next Oakville Ready Call with Oakville Green Conservation Association. We're really excited to have them join us this afternoon. Um, just prior to getting started, I'm just going to review the um, land acknowledgement. As a community, we have the responsibility to honor, care for, and respect all the creation gives to provide us with life. This includes the land, water, air, fire, animals, plants, and our ancestors. The Anishinaabek peoples have utilized this land for millennia, and we would like to acknowledge their direct descendants, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land upon which we live, work, and conduct ourselves. We acknowledge our treaty relationship and responsibilities to both the land and these original peoples. We also recognize that this land is rich in pre-contact history and customs, which includes the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee, uh, and since European contact has and continues to become home for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And it is in the spirit and intent of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, whereby we will collectively care for and respect the land, water, animals, and each other in the interests of peace and friendship, and for the benefit of not only ourselves, but of our future descendants. So welcome again, everyone. Uh, this call is sponsored by Oakville Ready, which is a partnership program with the Town of Oakville and the Halton Environmental Network. I'm gonna pass it over to Lisa Kohler to explain a little bit more about that. Thank you everyone for joining us today on uh, the next Oakville Ready call. Uh, my name is Lisa and I work at the Halton Environmental Network. One of the programs we co-propel is the Oakville Ready program. Uh, this program was generously funded through the Oakville Community Foundation and uh, the goal was to establish six uh, faith-based organizations to act as neighborhood uh, hubs in the time or instances of extreme weather. Um, this program is based on a neighbor helping neighbor concept. Uh, the goals were that we would engage diverse community stakeholders and provide resiliency We'd increase community capacity uh, and resiliency during times of need. And we'd also uh, gain a better understanding of how our community can work together during extreme weather events. Uh, when we were uh, putting the Oakville Ready program together, we did uh, assess need. And um, uh, currently, uh, we do have a rise in the frequency of emergencies uh, when it comes to climate challenges, including um, flooding, uh, weather-related freezing, uh, uh, extreme wind events, etc. Uh, we did, after our first, um, after we did assess the need, we did uh, realize that there was a need in community to help uh, during those times of extreme weather for the first one to four hours. Um, so these hubs uh, will open within the first one to four hours and they will help community by offering a warm cup of tea, centralize the emergency, and uh, be an area and a means of proper communication. Uh, we hope that by enacting the hubs, we will embed our community with resiliency and build stronger connections with um, residents and the community on a whole. Uh, currently, the hubs are located in um, these great faith-based organizations, uh, the Church of the Incarnation, St. Paul's United, uh, Knox, Kerr Street Mission, Maple Grove, Cherie Bethel, and St. Cuthbert's. Um, this program would not have been possible without our wonderful partners and supporters. Uh, that includes the region of Halton, Faith in the Common Good, and crew out of Toronto. In light of physical distancing, the Oakville Ready program has pivoted and um, we are currently providing technical support uh, to FB the FBOs and our hubs. Uh, we are working on wellness checks uh, with those communities and enabling them to ensure that their communities are taken care of. And we have more resources uh, available on our website, oaklaready.ca, and our Twitter account at oaklaready. Uh, if you are having any uh, challenges with COVID or would like any information about uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, please feel free to go to the regional website, that's www.halton.ca, or dial 311. Um, just for this call, just to review very quickly, please feel free to use the chat box uh, as much as possible. That's where we can field questions. Um, at the very end, uh, that's when uh, Helen from Halton Food will be 
uh, sharing the questions, your questions with uh, Beatrice from Oakville Green. Uh, you can look for the hands up feature too to ask questions. And again, just uh, privately um, chat or message the hosts. Um, that's the Halton Environmental Network or Oakville Ready. Uh, we're here to answer any technical questions that you may have. Uh, during this call, if we can just respect confidentiality, keep yourself on mute, use the chat box to communicate, always take care of yourself and share the air in the chat box. And uh, we'd like to question ideas, not people. And uh, again, if you need any other information regarding COVID, please feel free to look at the regional website, www.halton.ca or call 311. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Beatrice to the call. Uh, Beatrice is a fantastic individual in our community, always advocating um, for our community when it comes to native pollinator uh, gardens and she is a true asset. So uh, Beatrice, I will let you take it away from here. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you um, everyone for joining us today and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really um, excited and happy to be here. I think this year, even though it's been completely different and our growing season is going to be a little bit uh, different than it is in, in previous years, it's, um, it gives us a chance and an opportunity to actually spend more time in our, um, in our gardens and do actually more for um, our community and the environment. So first I want to start um, sharing a little bit about Oakville Green, which is the organization that I uh, work with. And Oakville Green is a non-for-profit organization in Oakville, so we are a grassroots uh, organization. We have a very strong group of uh, volunteers that are part of the board and that help us to uh, do a lot of um, habitat restoration and we do a lot of um, invasive species removal and tree planting. And uh, we came to the um, realization that at some point, even though there are a lot of public lands, it was just as important to work with homeowners and to make sure that people were doing something in their own uh, yards. In Oakville, about 60% of the property um, that makes the town is actually private property. So we have the idea that in order to help the environment, um, and I know I had that idea, uh, I had to move to like the Amazon rainforest and go really far away, um, and we tend to forget that we can actually make a huge difference in our own um, communities by working on the small piece of land that, um, that we have to work with. Um, so why are we planting uh, native trees in our home? So basically one of the main threats to biodiversity lately is how uh, the population growth and how the habitat is being destroyed and is being reduced and um, at the same time how in our ideas the, the our ideal habitat as humans has become very uh, non-friendly for other species. So here the idea is to try to reincorporate um, some of the things that nature had been working on for, for a very long time where everything was a little bit more balanced and we have many different uh, species of plants and animals uh, working together. So while we plant native species in our homes, we're actually helping and supporting um, a wide uh, net of um, pollinators and other native um, plants and animals that were or called the our place uh, home. So um, the main idea here, what I want uh, us to take away today is that we need to start gardening with a purpose. So not only having like monoculture, beautiful green lawns, right? Which is an, the idea that, that we have, especially I think in North America where everything has to be totally pristine, no weeds, nothing extra in there, but that's actually not very, not only inviting, but it's not healthy, right? You will never see an environment, a natural environment where there's only one species growing. So we need more diversity and we need to include more um, species in order to attract and to bring more balance into, into our gardens. So I would like to invite you to start gardening with a purpose. So every time that you're going to put something in your garden, think of what is the purpose of that specific species in there uh, and why are you picking the species um, that you are um, selecting, trying to help or keep in mind what benefits can it bring to others. And even if you are planning to do like a veggie garden, which is usually one of the um, questions that we get 
the most if you put pollinator species or native species that will attract pollinators around and if you mix them you are going to get more produce because there's going to be more pollinators around that are going to be pollinating your crops as well right so this is a win-win situation yeah okay next one thanks lisa um okay now why we are putting native flowers okay thanks okay so and this is something that um, I've seen here a lot, and I think it's a, it's a problem all over the world. When we want one species, we, we, we like one type of flower or plant, um, we do not, or usually we do not think on how they're going to do and how they're going to um, interact with our environment. And in many cases, we put things that are not supposed to be here. It's a little bit harder to maintain them. Um, and that's one of the benefits of native flowers too, that once they are established, they, they need very little care from our end because they're used to the conditions. While where you're bringing things that are not from here, uh, once they can, they can actually become invasive species because there's no predators or biological controls out there. And the other one is harder uh, for us to maintain them. So the, the examples that I have here are pretty obvious. And sometimes we plant things that are probably not as obvious, but still are not from here. So I have a banana plant, which will not survive our winters in Canada. Um, but then I have a cacti, and I've seen some cacti in here that people try to uh, grow, which are usually for more, I, that doesn't mean that we do not have some uh, that are suitable for these environments, but a lot of the ones that people try to grow are not. Um, and the problem with those ones is that the species that we have in here, like other pollinator species and other, um, and other bugs will actually not feel attracted or, use to the nectar sources and food. So it does not really have an ecological uh, purpose where we are. Okay. Okay. Um, so we, when we plant native flowers, we are going to be able to attract pollinators that are adapted to them. And a lot of the times it's, it can be even like the size or the length of the tongue in a butterfly that is actually specifically adapted to one species. It can be that uh, the larvae of some of the of some uh, butterfly species or some plants are, or, or sort of, uh, bugs sorry, are only adapted to eat that specific um, plant. So there's a lot of symbiotic relations that, that we find between native species and by planting uh, native flowers, we are actually helping m way more than only one um, species. As I said before, once they are established, they need less care, uh, less water, they're used to our weather, they're used to our type of soil, so they need um, less work from our part as well. Now, one, more, one interesting thing that I want to um, point out here that I think is important as well is that we should find flowers that have different bloom times. This will not only help pollinators because they're going to find food sources throughout the whole season or growing season, but it makes our garden look more interesting as well throughout, right? So I put here three examples of plants that will bloom at different times that will make your garden beautiful no matter what time of the year it is. So choke cherry is usually an early bloomer, right? So you will have when um, pollinators are coming back from hibernation or are starting to like move around and try to find food sources. This is one of the uh, things that they can, or can provide them with uh, food and nectar and pollen. Then we have something like purple cone flowers, another type of cone flowers that will um, bloom like midsummer. And then we have some other things that are late bloomers. So on the, they are going to be able to have flowers and provide food all the way to the frost. And so that way we are actually increasing our growth um, season and our gardens are going to look um, nicer. Right? Okay. Um, okay. So what, what is a pollinator and why we care? So as I said, and I have been mentioning, one of the most important things of native um, flowers or planting native species is because we are helping pollinators. And I think this is, we probably have heard this since we were in kindergarten, but I think the importance of pollinators is not, I don't think people really, really understand and, and have a, a real gasp of what uh, they mean to us. A lot of our foods come from pollinators. It's not only bees that we are talking about, it goes like way wider than that. Uh, and there's a lot and a lot, a lot of um, pollinators that are the ones that keep the things going. And I'm, I'm not sure 
if anybody here, I, I usually give these talks to kids and school children, school aged children. So I use the example of the B movie. So I don't know if you guys have seen the B movie, but it is important to recognize that uh, in that movie, they did a really good job showing what would happen if bees stopped working, which I think is a good uh, reflection of what would happen if pollinators um, stop working. So plants and um, uh, plants and, and insects basically evolved together and again in a symbiotic relation so they need each other in order to survive so we need pollinators to bring pollen from one plant to another so then more seeds can be uh, produced and then more plants can be produced from that okay so as I mentioned before pollinators are not only bees. We have a lot of solitary bees here in Ontario, so not even uh, the honeybees, which are European, um, so they're not native, but we do have a lot of different um, bees and bumblebees in here. We have butterflies, there's a lot of beetles, uh, there's hummingbirds, bats are pollinators as well, and there are other different types of mammals and lizards that can be pollinators. So pollinators are basically just the ones that help to complete the cycle of um, flower reproduction, right? Okay. Now, even if we want to be super selfish when we are uh, planning and trying to protect pollinators, pollinators are important uh, because they help most of our crops. So most of our food actually comes from pollinators. There's a lot of studies that show that if we didn't have pollinators or if their numbers declined too much, we would not have um, a lot of the food that uh, that we enjoy right so the ones that are in the screen right now are just examples of things that need to be pollinated by animals um, so that's why it's important to make sure that we have um, that we support the population of pollinators okay okay here i have some examples of solitary bees as i mentioned we have I think it's close to 200 species of um, solitary bees in ontario so these are bees that do not live in hives they are solitary, which means that they are on their own. A lot of them make their nests on wood, an old wood, uh, some, sometimes even on the ground, like on bare ground. Um, they are usually smaller than the, the, um, the European bee, but they are just as important or even more important for our native um, flowers. Okay. Now, when we are planning our garden, as I said, like I know a lot of people are now thinking on, on doing uh, vegetable gardens and food gardens, and that's amazing. Like I, I'm really, I think food security should be another um, thing that we should keep top of mind. But there's no reason for us not to be planning or planting more natives in our gardens so we can actually have more purpose and do more thing in, 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 in the space that we have, right? So for a lot of the studies now that talk about pollinator gardens and what pollinators need, they talk about a combination between grasses and flowers and bushes. So it's not only flowers that they need, but they actually need shelter as well. And they need, uh, like, to be a suitable habitat, you need to have a combination. And grasses have a lot of advantages as well because they are, like, um, less labor intensive. So you don't have to worry uh, too much about them but they provide shelter and they provide a lot of pollen and the, the pollen that they provide is actually higher in protein than the one in flowers. Um, so it provides a good food source um, for a lot of pollinators as well. And they bring a, like very interesting textures too. So if you like the, the new um, literature actually shows that you should have about 30% of grasses in pollinator gardens. So between 30 and 50% of your plants should be grasses. Okay, now, um, another advantage of having natives is that you're going to provide texture and you're just going to be uh, a nice garden all year long, right? So you, when you're planning a garden, it's always good to try to think of the whole four seasons, right? Especially in a place like Canada, where you're going to find uh, that we have really cold winters, so it needs to still uh, look nice when it is in the winter, but not only that, but provide shelter a lot of our um, insects hibernate in our gardens under the leaf litter and stuff like that so it's important to um, not only plan for all seasons visually but at the same time based on what our the, the pollinators are in that area are going to um, 
to need and use. So again, finding like different blooming times, things that have stems that are different colors, like red osier dogwood, for example. So you can give a little bit of color even during the winter. Uh, grasses give a little nice texture as well during the winter. So again, that combination um, will make it more attractive all year round. Okay, so Again, and, and going with uh, the topic that uh, that I was mentioning, and, and that I think a lot of the questions that we get usually are about um, like edible bushes and things that you can eat as well. So while you're planting natives, it's important to keep that in mind that even though you're helping pollinators, that doesn't mean that you cannot make something that can be turned into a nice pie, right? So. Um, one one important thing that I would mention is that when we are looking uh, natives, please try to look for sources of uh, or like seed sources or uh, nurseries that will provide things that are from here and they're actually local. A lot of um, people that work in the nurseries are not uh, familiar with native species and what native species are. So it's important for you to to uh, make the point with them that you're trying to find things that have been here. For like a very very long time i remember when i first moved to ontario um there was one guy at a nursery that was trying to convince me that tomatoes were native and i think what he meant was that they were being grown in ontario which does not necessarily mean that they're from here right so make sure that you know uh before you get there what are the species that um that you want okay so now uh going to i'm going to give a few examples of uh bushes that are uh, that can be planted in, in, in Ontario and that are very successful because, as I said, they're adapted to our type of soil and our weather um, and they can be edible, right? Uh, Cerberus berry is one, of the, is one of my favorite ones. It's an early bloomer, so it's, it's one of the uh, first things that blooms in my garden. I do have a Cerberus berry in a corner. Uh, the fruit is, is usually ripe by the summer, so it's one of the first things that you can actually eat from your garden, which is uh, nice too. It has uh, very sweet berries that are very rich in iron and copper. They are rich in vitamin C as well. Um, they can be eaten just from the bush, right? So that you don't need to cook them. Um, and it is a very important bush for pollinators, because as I said, it's an early bloomer. And it's a host uh, bush for butterfly larvae. So that means that the butterflies are going to lay their eggs on them and the larvae are going to feed on, um, on the leaves. Um, for different types of, of, uh, of butterflies, right? So I have here some examples like tiger butterflies, the viceroy, and some admirals are the ones that are going to be uh, feeding on them. But there's a lot of beetles that will uh, feed on uh, Cerberus berry as well. And it provides a lot of food for uh, bird, uh, birds too, right? Because those berries are obviously one of the first berries that come out and uh, birds are all over them. I know I have to usually fight with a lot of birds in my garden to eat a little bit or some service berries usually they get to them before I do um, but yeah so that's that's one of the species one of the other advantages that service berry has is that they are drought tolerant so even though they they do like um, to have their wet feet as well they are tolerant to uh, to drier um, soil so that's another advantage for them okay okay here's um, Elderberry. So elderberry is one of my favorite ones. I have I have a, a, two elderberries in my house and I use it to make elderberry syrup. So probably that's where you have uh, heard it from. It was very used uh, by First Nations. It's very high in vitamin C um, and it um, usually for cold and cough uh, syrups is what they use it for. The berries are not or should not be eaten raw. They can be harmful, so they have to be cooked. They need to be heated in order for us to be able to eat them, but you can make jelly, you can make syrup, as I said, pies, it's okay as well. Um, they are late bloomers too, so usually they, they mature between like mid-August and September, um, so they're ready to harvest close to or the beginning of the fall or the end of the summer. Now, the only problem with elderberry, and that's one thing that we should uh, keep in mind, is that they grow through soccer so a lot of the times it's a little bit harder to control so if you're going to have them in your garden you have to make sure that you keep to like cut the suckers when they are coming out um it's a good idea when you're pruning them to keep an eye on the the 
um, older branches because usually the, the branches that are older than four years old, they reduce the amount of, of uh, berries that they produce. So that's when you can actually cut some of those branches down and let some of the suckers up to um, compensate for the ones that you are cutting. Um, but I, I would say just keep that in mind, right? That it just, it's a beautiful, I, I, I really like it. It's a beautiful bush, it's big, but at the same time, it is, um, it is a little bit harder to control if you want to have it in a nice manicured lawn in your garden. In, if you're trying to put it in a, in a large area, this, this, this bush is perfect because it propagates really fast and, uh, and it can help to naturalize, um, naturalize areas, right? And it, again, the berries are very useful for um, a lot of um, wildlife too. Um, okay. okay. Um, Nannyberry, it's, a, it's, a, it's another bush that can be very interesting throughout the whole year. That's one of the things that I like about it because it has like the showy white flowers in the spring, but then the color that it turned in the, in the fall is actually really nice because it's burgundy in the fall. And then it has the blueberries that are uh, available for birds in, in, in the winter or later in the season too. So this is another really nice uh, bush to have if you're trying to attract pollinators and birds into your garden. They can grow a little bit more than the other two species that I mentioned before, but again, it can be pruned to kept in a, like at a smaller um, size and more controlled if you wanted to. Um, it is a great host plant for pollinators, uh, a good source of like berries throughout the winter, as I mentioned. Um, Nary berry is, likes, likes a little bit more water than the cerise berry, but can still tolerate drought. Um, as well, um, and it's a pretty easy bush to maintain um, as well. Okay, now, um, as I mentioned before, having a nice combination of like grasses and sedges um, makes your garden look more interesting and at the same time provides shelter for a lot of uh, bugs. So a lot of them, a lot of the, the, the pollinators or other bugs like ladybugs, for example, will actually hibernate on their, um, between the, the foliage or of the dry foliage of grasses and under the mulch, right? So they're low maintenance, which is another thing that I like. And they come back, like if you pick native grasses, they will come back every year, right? So that's a, there are perennials, which is another advantage. Um, now, one of the mistakes that we usually make with grasses is that they sometimes, especially the natives turn, Take a, they take a little bit longer to start uh, growing in the spring than some of the ones that we buy in um, or have been grown in, in, in greenhouses that we can buy. So a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people, especially like neighbors and stuff, when I'm walking around, they remove the old, the old ones and then put, um, put new ones. We just have to give them a little bit more time to grow and give them enough space. Sometimes we tend to plant them too, um, too close to each other as well. Um, here's one example. So this one is the little blue stem. Little blue stem is uh, a grass that it's only about like three foot tall and it's a nice bush grass. I love the colors of it as well because it's between like green and blue um, and it has a nice rust color uh, in the fall. This again, it's a native and it's the, the pollen is very rich in, um, in protein, okay? Okay, now, uh, this is one of my favorite plants in my garden as well. So when it comes to milkweed, I'm pretty sure we all have heard of milkweed before. There's three species of milkweed that are um, native to Ontario. So we have the butterfly milkweed, the swamp milkweed, and we have the common milkweed. If you're going to grow it in your garden, the swamp milkweed and the butterfly milkweed are easier to uh, keep under control as well. I love common milkweed, but it tends to get a little bit uh, wildy and out of control. Uh, but if you want to plant it, that is definitely the, the, the one that, is the, that monarch butterflies favor the most. So if you're going to find larvae, you, are more, you have more chances to find it on, on the common milkweed, but these two other are, they're in the same family and they're the same, they're host um, plants for uh, butterfly, butterfly, uh, monarch butterflies. Now monarch butterflies in this case, again, this is another symbiotic relation, which means that monarch butterflies need the 
milkweed. That's the only plant that they can feed on when they are larva. And the, the, the white milk contains a chemical that is actually poisonous to animals that have a backbone. Um, and that's why it was the obnoxious weed least for a while. Now it has been removed from there, so now we can grow it uh, all over the province. And um, that makes, when the, when the caterpillars are eating the, the leaves, they are, while they're eating that, uh, those components, they become poisonous themselves. So that is one of the mechanisms that they have to protect themselves against uh, predators. Now, this is again a perennial uh, plant. They are a little bit slower growers in the springtime. So again, you have to be patient and remember where you have them. I know I have like a specific section in the garden when I know they are there. So I don't plant anything else because usually everything else is already growing and they have not started. Uh, so you have to give them a little bit of time, but they have a big tap root underneath. So even if you don't see them and if you don't, they don't seem that they are there anymore, they, like the tap root is still there and it's still developing. Um, they have nice color of flowers. In the case of the common milkweed, they're purple. In the case of the swamp milkweed, is a pink one that you see there. And the butterfly milkweed is the one that is in like orange yellowish. Um, the butterfly milkweed is a little bit shorter and it is more like a, um, like more rounded and again more controlled and more smaller. In the case of the swamp milkweed, it is, it is larger. Um, or it, it grows taller than, than the other one. Uh, I think they're both beautiful. I really like how, how they look. I, I love the flowers and I love all the biodiversity that they bring because even though they are, yeah, they are host for the monarch butterflies, but there's many other insects and in, in, in many other um, different bugs that feel attracted to them. And they are deer resistant, which I think is an advantage. So again, there's going to be a lot of bugs that will eat them, but there's not that many, um, animals with a backbone or vertebrates that will actually feed on it. So that's another advantage when you're uh, looking for different species to have in your garden. Okay, um, so this one is wild columbine. This one is another um, plant that flowers a little bit earlier in the season. Uh, they're only like one to three feet tall. I love the flowers. They kind of like hang out um, or hang down from the stems. And this is one of the species that will actually attract not only butterflies, but hummingbirds. So when hummingbirds are starting to like show up around Ontario, this, this, this flower is, is a good uh, nectar source uh, for them. They can propagate from seed pretty easily. So that's another advantage uh, for them. So once they start or they, they get established in one area, they will just um, um, keep growing in there. It is, um, it is a perennial as well. It will come out. Uh, it has nice green foliage that stays in one place too and it's like uh, a little bit easier to control too. It doesn't take over your garden. Um, I just think it's, it's a beautiful flower. It's very colorful. And as I said, like it attracts a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pollinators, but hummingbirds are, are attracted to this one a um, lot. Right? Okay. Okay, so this is probably one of the most common and known native plants uh, in Ontario. So a lot of people have it in their, in their backyards. This is a black-eyed Susan. Um, it's a compound flower. Their blooming times can go all the way from, depending on where you are, sometimes even, early, even uh, late June, all the way to October. So this is a very nice plant and flower to have um, in your garden because it will provide flowers for like a very long time. Um, it is a host species for some of our butterflies too. Uh, the bothered patch, uh, the gorgon uh, checker spot larva will feed on it. Um, and again, it's a, it's a flower that will grow only like between one and three feet tall. They do seed a lot, so you will you will encounter that wherever you are planting them, they do tend they do not. I wouldn't say they don't take over because they're not aggressive, but you're going to find uh, new plants or new uh, black eyes seasons growing around. Um, they can, they are drought tolerant and they can tolerate water too. So this is one of the species that you can actually plant in um, rain gardens, for example. And, uh, but at the same time, they are drought tolerant. So this is a good species. They need full sun. All the, all the flowers that I showed um, 
they need full sun or like if it's partial shade they still it needs to be kind of like a lighted shade um shade um but these ones are not they're not complicated they're pretty um they can grow in like sand or clay so they actually like clay too so this is a very easy uh, species to grow in your gardens um as well okay so Again, as, as I mentioned before, I am, I'm, I'm part of Oakville Green and I'm really proud of, of, of the work that, um, that our board is doing right now. They are trying to, they, they, every year we do a plant sale. So we realized, as I mentioned at the beginning, that um, we needed to do something in people's properties and it was hard to find native species in our garden centers. And um, native species that were uh, reliable when it comes to making sure that they were not treated with pesticides. A lot of the seeds that we encounter in, in a lot of the rain garden, in a lot of the, the, the garden centers were actually treated uh, with pesticides that will affect the nectar and the pollen later, that can affect pollinators. And, uh, and they're locally sourced, which is another important thing because sometimes we do find, in the case of milkweed, for example, milkweed grows all the way from here to Mexico, but the seeds that you're going to find in Mexico are not as adapted as, as they are if they're from here. So locally sourced uh, seeds is another important part. So basically what we decided to do, I think four years ago was to do, we do the research, we go around, we find the species and we have a plant sale. That is, you can go into our website and, uh, and order the, the, like all the plants that I mentioned today and more. We do have uh, some native trees as well. Uh, we have more bushes and we have pollinator kits. So you can actually buy one kit and get uh, different species of pollinator plants um, that you can plant. And that way we are trying to um, to help and, and then to help like to reduce the work that you have to do in doing like all the research and trying to find uh, the species. So yeah, feel free to like visit our website and find out about like all the species and we have like a little bit of information there and like how much space they need and what are the conditions that they need to grow. Okay. Now, how to take care of your garden. So I would say the first thing that you have to do is to, when you're planting, pick the right location for your plant. So if before you buy a plant or before you plant it in your garden, make sure that you know what are the conditions that a plant needs. So if it's, need that it's, that if it's a plant that needs full sun, do not put it in a shaded place, do not put it under a larger tree. And I know it seems um, pretty obvious, but just do a little bit of research in each of the plants that you're planting to make sure that you have the right spot for that plant. Make sure that you know what type of soil you have, if it's like clay or if it's sand, uh, before you are uh, picking your 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 plant and knowing where you're going to put it. Um, another important part too is we use a lot of mulch, and again that that provides like a, especially being in, in a place where it can get really cold during the winter times and for the first years where your plants get established, putting like a layer of mulch will actually help to keep the moist there, but it provides like a blanket for the the plants that you are uh, or the garden that you are starting. Don't be uh, discouraged the first or second year when you're starting up a new project. It takes a little bit for plants to get established and, and grow. And then the next, the next thing that I would say is to try to keep, um, as I said, like different textures and plants that bloom different types of the year. So then it, you make your garden interesting all year round. Um, and that will help you to keep your uh, spirits up and keep wanting to do more um, in your garden. Okay, now when you are uh, starting or planting a uh, garden, the first year or the first two years, it's very important to help it a little bit. So while plants get established, uh, you have to water them a little bit more. And once they are established, as I said, because they're native, they're going to need very little care. But at the beginning, make sure that you water them a little bit extra so they, uh, to make sure that they are established, especially when we get those like two or three weeks of really dry heat in the summertime, you just keep an eye on them and try to make sure that the soil stays moisty so then they can actually um, get established and the root system can grow enough for, that, for the plants to be healthy after that. Um, and put them in a place where you know that they are not going to be like stepped on and again that you remember where they are. Uh, especially like this time of the year, for example, where some things probably you plant them 
the year before and now you don't know where they are because they have not emerged or all not all of them have um, so make sure that you have a, a, a way to know what you planted and where they are okay okay you can pass the next one lisa please okay um so what i would say too is that we have to remember that when we are creating a garden when we are taking care of our own garden our home we are actually creating a habitat we tend to think that cities are not uh a natural habitat or a natural ecosystem but they are actually an ecosystem and there are a lot of different bugs and plants and animals that want to or need to survive in here as well so don't see your space as only a garden look at it as a habitat so try to provide places for uh things to find shelter for them to find food, for them to like be able to thrive in that um, environment. Okay. Okay. Next one. Okay. So, just to make it kind of like a um, like a summary of, of a lot of the things that I mentioned before. So, when you are creating um, a garden, try to keep it not only attractive but useful as well for like when it comes to like biodiversity and native species. So plant native flowers that bloom from early spring to late fall. So you have like a wide variety of, of blooming times. Don't use pesticides, it's another important one. And here, if you, plant, if you plant a good variety and a lot of biodiversity, you're going to need less pesticides. And actually putting a lot of uh, native plants will actually help to control, it, you will attract animals that will probably feed on some of the pests that you have on your veggies and stuff. So having more variety and more biodiversity in your garden would actually help uh, to reduce the use of pesticides or the need to use pesticides. Make sure to include larval host plants, so again, where like the caterpillars can, can grow and feed on, provide enough shelter. So with either the mulch or to put a, a, or to leave the plants there during the fall so do not clean your garden unless we are already about like 10 degrees or the temperatures reach about 10 degrees and we are not going below zero during the night during the night um so then we can provide shelter for a lot of the bugs that are hibernating or or finding shelter in our garden um and yeah i think i want to keep i saw that there was like a lot of uh, activity in the chat so i want to make sure that i have enough time to answer some of the um questions so if you have questions please let me know hi uh beatrice so yes. i'm going to ask all the questions i've been taking notes um our first one is from beth and she asked about japanese anemone i always pronounce that wrong but i think you know what i'm trying to say um would they be considered native she has had uh, that plant for several years and they are brutal to control, but the bumblebees love them and they bloom between September and October. So what is, I guess, a two part question there. Are they native? And if they're attracting the bees, is that such a bad thing? OK, so we do, we do have a Canadian anemone. Um, so the Japanese is, is not from here, so it's not considered native. But again, I think we we. A lot of the things that we have are not necessarily like I think we can favor native species it does not necessarily mean that we cannot plant anything else as long as we keep it under control and it doesn't become invasive in other places. So in the case of anemone, it can become invasive. I don't know that it, and in play, if it's considered invasive here in, in Ontario, and I don't think it is. Um, but we have to be careful with the species that we pick. If in, if in this case, it is a plant that is under control and she can keep it under control in her garden, it is growing fine. There's a lot of bumblebees and bees that feel attracted to it. I, I, I would not say to remove every single plant that is not native. I just like whenever you are planting or planting new things, keep in mind that you should prefer to plant things that are, um, that are native. Question. Uh, the next question comes from Karen. Um, it was a bumper crop of service berries last year. So I guess I'm adding on to this question. Do you know what the conditions were that would create that, um, that bumper crop of service berries? Like what, what were they so happy about last year that they produced so many, do you know? <laughs> And, and, you, and, and you know what? And it was not only service berries. I think I, 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 I don't know exactly what happened, but I know service berries and I know elderberries. It was, it was crazy. I, I have to agree. So a lot of the bushes that had um, 
Now, hanberries were, were crazy last year. I, I can tell that from, from like the ones that I have in my garden and from the ones that I encounter on my, on my walks. Uh, and it was very bad for other types of berries. For example, my raspberries didn't do well last year at all. So no, I, 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 I don't know why it was such a good year, but I, I do agree that it was an amazing year. Good. Yeah, we had one comment from Karen that says it was probably because it was a very wet spring. So that's, well, yeah. that could be well true. Yeah. Uh, we have another question uh, from Tracy. She wants to know if elderberries grow in containers. <sighs> They could, they could. So you, you could, you would have to give them like a very big pot. The only problem here is the cold. So whenever you are planting something in a pot, you have to make sure that it is going to be tolerant at least two zones colder than when you are planting them. Because when you're putting them on the ground, the, the, the freezing temperatures do not go as low or as below as they can um, as if you put them in a pot. So in the pot, you're going to have two problems. It's going to get too warm in the summer too, if, it, if you get like direct sun there and it go, it's going to get colder when it's uh, winter time. So you have to make sure that either you bring it, you will not be able to like bring it in, like not an elderberry because they're too big, but it, if it's in like a shelter, in a sheltered area, you can try. We are kind of like on the um, edge of this, like just look at the zones of the plant. So make sure that you are not planting anything that needs, needs it to be like a little bit warmer. I'm not sure what elderberry, I mean, I don't think elderberry will do that well if it's in a pot because I think it will not um, tolerate if it gets too, too cold, but I, I might be wrong. And you will have to like water it more, especially during the summertime. You will have to like be careful um, about that. And they need a lot of root space too, like the roots tend to like extend. So if it's a pot, it will have to be a really large pot because this can be a large plant. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another one from Len. Uh, are there any grasses that would be good in low light conditions or lower light conditions? He has a north facing yard, but it's blocked by a massive tree that's uh, his neighbor's tree. So he's tried before with some grasses and they failed, but there must be some that do well in part shade to shade conditions. Yeah, there might be some sed like there might be sedges that are probably a little bit better. I can get, I can. If you don't mind giving me, I can, I can share that, uh, like a list of species with him. Um, later I have a list that Sean James shared with us and I do have a list of, of, of species that are shade tolerant. Okay, so hopefully he gets in touch with you there. Um, another question, um, someone picked up, Lisa picked up some seeds, common milkweed seeds on a CD Sunday. Um, hopefully it was our, I believe it was our Oakville CD Sunday. And she's just finishing up the cold stratification process. So should she plant those in the ground now or should they be potted first? No, she can put them on the ground now or she can, she can start it growing them in, in like an egg, like in eggshells or like any, uh, any other way. I, I would say milkweed is one of the hardest plants to grow from seed. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's, it can be very challenging. So don't feel discouraged if you don't, if you're not successful the first time you do it, but yeah, you can put them on the ground right now. Uh, make sure to keep them, moist or wet, uh, especially at the beginning. And um, some of the ways in which you can make them uh, grow a little bit faster too, if you're just bringing them out of stratification, you can put them in uh, warm water for a little bit and kind of like rub them and then put them in, in, in the soil. Okay. Um, and then somebody has, Tracy S has swamp milkweed. And because it has a tap root, uh, she wants to know if it's possible to split, uh, split it or not. So I'm assuming divisions. Yes, no, no, they're not. Like mealweed is not um, because it's a single tap root and it's, it's harder. So no, you have to start them from seed. Okay. Um, and then we've had a couple of questions about the, your pollinator kits at the Oakville Green plant sale. So the wild columbine, would that, is that only sold in a bundle? Can it be sold separately? And then someone would like to know what's in the large pollinator kit. Sure, so we are still waiting to finalize the, the we, we, uh, if you go into our website, we do have a list of uh, species that we have provided in years before. We are still waiting for the final list from the, um, from the nurseries right because they they still have to see what survived and what didn't survive the winter so we usually get it around uh this time of the year or like a little bit um at the end of april 
so we can finalize the list uh, by them and we try to provide a good uh, mixture and a combination of plants it, it always brings about um, I think previous years have been 15 species Karen um, you can say if, if I'm saying something that I shouldn't say please put it in the chat box but I think it's about like 15 species what we have done in in previous years so um, while Columbine I don't think that has been sold uh, separately before, but if they only want wild columbine, um, contact us and we can um, come up with a plan to do that. Because yeah, it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice species and it's, it's nice to have in the garden. Um, there's interest in learning more about habitat for pollinators. Would you be able to share more information? So yes, you included like, don't clean up your garden until it's 10 degrees Celsius at night and you know, keep the uh, leaves and little piles and uh, kind of a little bit of a messy yard, but is there anything else that's kind of crucial for people to know and it's not that information really isn't being shared? Uh, well, as widely. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, so um, I think as I said, like I think for me the, the, the key points are to have like a good like biodiversity. So the more plants that you have or the more different types of plants that you have, you're going to be able to like favor more species of pollinators and there's going to be more biodiversity in, in, in your garden. So I, planting a variety of things is, is the main um, point, I think. The second one is having a combination between like grasses and bushes and flowers um, that is similar to what would happen in nature, right? In nature, you will not have only all grasses or all flowers. You will have always a combination of those. Again, keeping the proportion of grasses to 30 to 50% of your, of your pollinator garden is another good one to provide enough shelter for them. Um, having different blooming times, which I already mentioned uh, as well. And then yes, it's very important during the winter time to just keep the, the um, keep your garden without a lot of, um, I wouldn't say messy, but it just, just want, you just want to keep the dead material in there so that it can be used for uh, over winter. We have to keep in mind that a lot of bugs stay, like spend the winter as larvae or as eggs um, inside of some of the dry stems or in the mulch uh, or in the dead grasses. So every time that we are removing those, we're actually harming or removing some of those uh, eggs and larvae as well. So keeping those in, in, in place would actually help those species that are already there to uh, to be born in our garden or to emerge in spring. Uh, so that definitely helps as well. Uh, do not use pesticides this is another very important one. Um, do not put two plants like too close to each other or too close to like wood or whatever that that usually increases the, the chances for um, diseases in plants as well. So that's, an, that's another important one. So give enough space for all of them to grow. Uh, so when you are planting something, consider the full growth size of what you are planting instead of how they look the day that you are planting them, which is I think a mistake that, that a lot of people do um, as well. Um, yeah, another thing that, I, that I've seen often are uh, like some of the solitary bee houses which again, they have to like, if you're going to put one, make sure that you are taking good care of it and that you like understand the guidelines and what you have to do because of the, there, there are a lot of studies that show that um, they can be, if they're not uh, managed properly, they can actually be harmful um, to these bugs, but, or putting a water source is another important one. So you can put like a small container with some rocks or pebbles or something, a little bit of water. Uh, you can either even add um, like a little bit of like Himalayan salt or like sea salt to it too. Um, yeah. So I just have two more quick questions. Uh, we have somebody who lives in an apartment building with a balcony and it gets afternoon sun. Do you have any ideas for native plants that can go in containers? Shit. So a lot of the flowers, like for example, the black eyed Susan would be a good one. Like there's asters that can be grown um, in there as well. There's even some... Um, I've seen lilies doing really well in, 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 especially if you're only going to put them out in the, like during the, the, the summer months, right? Then, then those plants will actually um, survive pretty, pretty well. So yeah, so lilies and, and I've seen, like, I know, I know a person that even has, um, like the butterfly milkweed on, like on their, their, uh, in their garden on pots. So there's, like, as I said, like, it's not, 
it's not so um, like if you are not planning on having them like perennial, like if you're planning them as animal, right? Like most of our natives would actually do fine. And one last one, I believe. I'm sorry if I've missed anybody's, but um, so within an actual vegetable garden to attract uh, good bugs, what would you recommend as a native plant that doesn't spread and is going to be well controlled if I planted it right in my vegetable garden? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I don't know. So what I usually do, I don't know, like to me, I, I don't know because our natives tend to uh, spread a little bit more. I tend to put, what I, what I do is to plant like herbs because a lot of the times, like I, I, I mix my veggies with my herbs. So then herbs sometimes are uh, like, don't, they, they, the bugs do not like the smell. So that helps to keep some of the plants uh, out or away from the, from the garden. I don't, I don't know. Oh, that's a good that's a good one to add herbs yeah. yeah all right i believe that is it a lot of people are looking for more information so i'm sure you will be contacted sure. um, and yeah everybody's going to find out more information especially if they want to see this list of uh of plants from sean james and and any other information they can get from you but you have added to your you'll be adding your information of how they can contact you so Back to you. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. And again, if you go like in our website, we do have a list of native species as well, right? Like it's not as, as, as comprehensive as the one that Sean shared with us, but it, it, it is a very good start. And we do have a lot of uh, different species in there and, and examples of things that can be grown. Oh, yeah. sorry. One more. Uh, are, are flowering raspberries edible? Oh, sorry. Karen actually answered that one. So they're edible, but not so juicy or sweet. So that was good. Okay. But thank you very much. <laughs> no All right. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Beatrice. And a lot of great questions and feedback in the chat as well. So we appreciate everyone's participation. Um, really great stuff. So just so that you're aware, we do have other webinars that have occurred and there are others coming soon. And if you go to the Oakville Ready website, as you can see on this slide, and the general resources tab near the center at the top, uh, which is being circled right now. If you, if you click on that, you'll see a tab that says webinars. So that's where you can see recordings of those that have happened in the past, including this one, which will be up within the next 24 to 48 hours, um, in addition to uh, promotions of the ones that are coming in the future. So if you want more information, please feel free to go to that site. And I think we've got a preview. Yes, we've got a preview of a couple of the calls that are coming up. Um, I believe both next week. Uh, so the Heart of Oakville Beats On, where we're going to talk about some of the, um, the Town of Oakville is going to talk about some of the work that the Parks and Rec staff have been stepping up to do, and also wanting to hear more about what other good things have been going on in the community of Oakville. So that one is next week. And in addition to another gardening um, webinar, which seemed to be very popular this time of year, so we're hoping to have more of those as well. This one is with a master gardener and there is a link or um, information in order to ask questions in advance so that uh, she can be prepared to answer those questions during the session. So take a look at that poster to get more information about that as well. And if you have any other ideas for calls you would like to see, please get in touch with Trisha Henderson or Lisa Kohler. Both email addresses are available there on that um, page. And again, we thank you all for joining us today. And thanks very much to Beatrice and the Oakville Green Conservation Association for being with us and sharing all of this great information and resources. Have a great day, everyone, and take care. Thanks again.